there, you're very welcome to this episode of Dark Vanishings. I hope you're keeping well wherever you are in the world. It's very rainy in Dublin here tonight. It's been raining for weeks. We won't complain because it feels like the rest of Europe, the rest of the world is struggling with heat and fires. But we've also had some sad news in Ireland in the last few days with the passing of the legendary Sinead O'Connor. Uh, Sinead is as I said, a legendary uh, figure in Ireland, an incredible vocalist, songwriter, activist, um, and everybody in Ireland, and I know around the world, is just so sad about the news of her passing. Uh, I, for one, would like to thank Sinead for all the joy that she uh, gave to me um, and to so many around the world. May she rest in peace. Our thoughts are with her family. So, Today's episode is about the mysterious deaths of Lizanne Froome, 22, and Chris Crammer's 21 in 2014. Both girls were from the Utrecht in the Netherlands. They worked in a coffee shop together and eventually uh, shared a flat together. They'd recently completed college. Lizanne had done a degree in applied psychology and Chris had uh, done art education. Um, and they were looking for uh, an adventure um, in which they would get to see a beautiful part of the world, but they would also learn Spanish, etc. And they would make a difference. They planned to volunteer in a local children's school. They would stay with the host family and they would also have a brief vacation uh, before they kicked off their volunteering work. So here we see them at the airport in the Netherlands, about to uh, jet off uh, all smiles. Uh, for their adventure. Sadly, both women would die in what many people consider to be mysterious circumstances uh, in Boqueta in Panama. In this video, I'd like to put forward a theory about their deaths. And I haven't seen this theory explored in any of the video coverage, which is very extensive. Um, and uh, I feel that it's a very viable theory and I'll be really interested to see your comments and to see what you think. And thank you, by the way, for all your great comments. They're just fascinating and for all your support. So let's get started. But first, the girls decided that when they would get to Panama, they would have a holiday uh, at Boco del Toro, this beautiful part uh, of the world. They would let their hair down, enjoy the beautiful beaches, mingle with other tourists. Uh, you know, they've been studying hard. So that's how they started uh, their trip overseas, essentially. Here we see the girls soaking up the sun, enjoying the beautiful white sandy beaches. They made friends with, you know, other Dutch tourists and tourists from around the world. So they were living their best life and they were having a well earned break from work responsibilities, study responsibilities. Uh, you know, everything was going fantastically well for the two girls. And you can see from the photos, they were just having a ball. So after a period of vacationing, the two girls would then travel on to Boqueta in Panama. And this was where they were going to be staying with the host family and they were going to be volunteering at the local school. But when they went to inquire at the local school uh, about getting started, etc., they were told rather rudely that there wouldn't be work for them for another week. So they had already been vacationing for quite a bit. They were obviously ready to get started with their volunteering etc so this was quite a setback and both girls were very despondent and recorded this uh in their diaries even though they said that you know the host uh, family the place that they were living in was you know large comfortable you know the surroundings were beautiful um you know they were despondent uh about this more sort of insecure start to you know their volunteering experience Interestingly enough, Lizanne in particular would be affected by this sort of setback and she would write in her diary that she suddenly felt overwhelmed with a lack of self-confidence. Um, she wished she could be near her mother and her father and she felt like she was a two-year-old toddler again because she suddenly felt very out of her depth. You know, this wasn't the touristic uh, destination that they had been in previously. 
when they arrived. Uh, th there was a big culture shift. Um, you know, this was uh, the real Panama, if you like. And, uh, you know, their work wasn't ready. And she just suddenly felt out of her depth. And she had been hesitant about going on the trip, she says in her diary in the first instance. You get a sense, actually, that Chris is maybe a little bit more worldly wise than um, Lizanne. And actually, in this photograph, uh, which was taken in Boqueta, where they were having lunch together, you can almost see, I think, a little bit of that frustration on Lizanne's face. So they didn't get off to the best start with their volunteering experience. Uh, in Boqueta. So on the 1st of April, uh, the girls decided to take a trek on the Panista, the El Panista there. Um, it has stunning views. Um, it's a very popular trek to do. Um, and we see them here, you know, as they are heading off for their trek. And um, obviously they now had an extra week to fill. So they sort of pulled themselves together and tried to kind of lift their spirits and, and thought, well, you know, let's look around our immediate surroundings. And that made a lot of sense. Now, ordinarily, most tourists would actually hire a guide uh, to do this trek. A particularly popular guide is Feliciano. Um, though it does say in reviews of Feliciano, tourist reviews of him, that as a woman, most women would not feel comfortable doing the trek on their own with him, that he was quite touchy and, you know, touchy feely, but that if you were with other people, etc., you know, uh, he was competent, competent guide, etc. But the two girls actually decided to do this trek by themselves. Now, Felicio's card would be found in their bedroom uh, subsequently after their deaths, but it's clear that on this day they had decided, despite having information about his services to go ahead and do the trek by themselves. So here we see them all smiles. I think their mood was obviously better and they were heading on this beautiful track. So the girls would reach the summit of the Panista around one o'clock and you see them throwing their arms in the air. They're super excited. And then they would make a decision that baffled their families and has baffled everyone they would decide to push beyond the continental divide uh, when most tourists, particularly without a guide, would have at this juncture turned back. Now, once you crossed over the continental divide, you were essentially entering more precarious, unpredictable terrain, more deeply forested terrain, um, you know, and they weren't dressed for hiking. They didn't have supplies. By the way, a dog uh, that belonged to a local restaurant owner at the base of the Panista, a dog would follow them, but would eventually come back without them, which sort of raised the alarm that something had gone wrong. Now, I personally feel that very little is said about the role of the school in all of this. And it does make me think about the duty of care that organisations have when they commit to taking volunteers who come miles from home to remote locations, you know, and who essentially can be very vulnerable. And uh, I think that if there hadn't been this one week delay, I feel pretty sure that these girls would not have crossed beyond the continental divide. They were both described as being sensible and diligent, um, you know, um, and I think that the host family described them, uh, Miriam, the lady with whom they were staying, you know, described them as being restless after the school said they couldn't start straight away and that they felt a little bit more insecure about what was happening with their volunteering experience. And I think that they were just restless and just looking to sort of kill the day, if you like. And I think it's probably Chris who is the one that prompted them to go forward. Um, I think that uh, Lizanne was a little bit more the cautious one, is my feeling. And a lot of people have looked at this photograph and tried to analyse the body language and said that, you know, Chris looks sort of fearful. I actually think she looks impatient. I think she's the one that pushed ahead. Um, you can see the widening distance between her and Lizanne. It looks like Lizanne is trying to keep up with her. And she's almost turning around as if to say to Lizanne, you know, come on, you know, catch up. She looks a little impatient with Lizanne. I think that both girls were incredibly close. And I think that if they had moments of impatience with each other, they were few and far between.
again, this is a photograph that is very much talked about and analysed in terms of um, Chris's body language, her mood. She doesn't look as, you know, happy. Um, I think if you look at the body language with the hand on the hip, she's actually a little bit impatient. I suspect she is the one that wanted to push forward. And that's not to apportion blame. And I suspect Rosanne was maybe a little bit more reticent. I mean, this is pure conjecture. I can't be 100% certain, but she's almost got the hand on the hip as if to say, you know, what's the big deal? Let's keep moving forward. That's the feeling that I get. That's what I see when I look at that photograph. Again, we see Chris here exploring. She's much further ahead than Nazan. I think she's the one that really wanted to explore. Uh, you know, they were restless, uh, obviously despondent, you know, when their placement wasn't starting straight away, you know, a little bit more uncertain about how things were going. And, you know, she's much further ahead than Lizanne here. Now, some people have said in this photograph, she looks as if her hands are tied behind her back. I think she's just playing up to the camera and she's just mucking around. And, and, and I don't see that at all. So if you look at this photograph, you can see that there's mud on the back of Chris's legs. And she just seems to be in her own world, forging ahead. And uh, um. I think that at this point she'd already had a fall and I think that they had crossed the continental divide. They must have been getting tired at this stage. So I feel what actually happened to the girls is that they had a fall. They fell off a cliff. I think most likely Chris fell first um, and that perhaps in trying to get to Chris, uh, Lizanne uh, also damaged herself as well, injured herself. And we'll talk about that shortly. Now, a lot of people have said that, you know, maybe they were murdered by a local gang or, you know, a serial killer and that this fall was staged or that, you know, they're getting lost in the forest was staged. I, I just don't think that um, killers and, you know, whether they're a gang or a serial killer would go to that sort of trouble to stage um, a, a, a disappearance. And I will explain why shortly. Something else that is significant is that there is a photograph, number 509, um, that disappears. And then we have no other photographs um, uh, until they've had a fall, uh, quite a few days after the fall. And I'll, I'll explain that as well shortly. Um, and, you know, that one of the photographs, 509, was deleted. I think that there is quite a simple explanation, quite a mundane explanation for this. People think that maybe it was some kind of a serial killer, you know, deleting a photograph that they were in or it was manipulated afterwards by authorities to cover up something. Um, I don't think so. I, I think it's possible because Liz, Lizanne was taking photographs continually of Chris that perhaps, uh, you know, uh, Chris took another fall. Uh, the photograph looked a bit odd. Lizanne manually deleted it. I think it's as simple an explanation as that. Another explanation could be that Chris took a fall and in getting down to uh, reach her, Lizanne was also injured, maybe dropped the camera. And even though there wasn't damage uh, on the outside, perhaps it just, you know, as it tumbled, it just deleted somehow, some kind of a glitch deleted the photograph. I think the first explanation is more likely that the photograph was just a bit odd because, you know, Chris had some kind of fall and um, she just like a reflex deleted it. I think it's possible, but, you know, it's, it's very hard to be 100% certain about what happened to 509. But I just don't think that the reasons are as fantastical, um, you know, as is being claimed in a lot of the uh, videos. I think there's a far more simple explanation for it. Blue, the dog that had accompanied the two girls up the trail, would arrive back to the base of the Panista without the two women. The host family with whom the two girls were staying would also notice that they hadn't slept in their beds. Feliciana would also arrive uh, to where the girls were living the next morning, stating that he was due to meet them, but they hadn't shown up. Uh, he would go off looking for them. Um, but he wasn't successful and the police wasn't notified till about 5 p.m. that day. Um, a lot of people have found Feliciano's behaviour strange, almost as if he was sort of inserting himself into the case. And many people thought that he could have been 
you know, responsible for possibly murdering them. I find this very unlikely. It's obvious he could be inappropriate at times, but that doesn't make you a murderer. You know, uh, you know, obviously it's not appropriate for him to make women feel uncomfortable by touching them, you know, inappropriately. But I, I just can't see him murdering the girls this is his livelihood and i i just don't think he would go there um i personally feel that both girls had a fall i think both of them were injured and at this point they were at the base of a cliff probably 40 or 50 uh feet uh down at the base of a cliff i think that's what could have even happened the camera may have dropped and you know that maybe deleted the photograph or it was a manual deletion because you have something had gone wrong um and uh sadly you know days would pass uh without the girls you know being found because they were in this more forested part of the penista um and difficult to um see uh so you know really really heartbreaking uh a heartbreaking set of circumstances now people have said you know was there a serial killer was this a ganglang kind of murder you know were they you know targeted because they were young and beautiful some kind of sexual motivation and then you know there was a kind of a cover-up in the forest that this was made to look like they had a fall or they got lost in the forest i, I really find that hard to believe i just don't think that a killer would go to the trouble you know of covering it up to the extent that people claim and I, I will explain why i also feel that there's a reason for their fall which hasn't been explored in any of the videos uh that i've watched i'll just be curious to what you know you think about this reason and, and bear with me to the end of the video because i will reveal it towards the end of the video so there was a lot of conjecture and a lot of speculation about why uh, Lausanne and Chris crossed over the continental divide I mean it's obviously very beautiful some people thought that maybe you know they wanted to soak up more nature that maybe they'd heard a waterfall etc and all of this is very likely and I, I think you know they probably did want to take in more nature but I think principally it was because they were restless and they had time to fill. they were at a loose end I honestly believe that had they actually you know started their volunteering when they were due to I, I I feel they would have been in a less restless mood anxious to fill the time and I don't think they would have made that decision um you know so there was certainly a lot of speculation you know as to why they would do this um it looks very beautiful these parts of the world but obviously you know it is so easy to get lost it's so easy to fall there are so many high cliffs um but uh, you know I will get into that very shortly so 10 weeks later, on the 14th of June, a local woman would discover uh, Lizanne's blue black plaque. It was found on a riverbank some 10 miles away from the Peniston, where the girls were, were trekking, basically. I don't think that's unusual. It was probably carried by the current inside the backpack were two bras, the girls' bras, uh, sunglasses, the phones and the camera. Now, everything was perfectly intact which people found really mysterious. People thought that perhaps the bag had been planted there. I think that this is very unlikely. I don't think there's anything unusual about the girls' bras being found uh, in the backpack. I think that, you know, having fallen off a cliff or, or even possibly as they walked in the jungle, they may have found it more comfortable to remove their bras. Um, and I think certainly if a serial killer had been involved, they would be very unlikely to fold these things neatly into the backpack like this. You know, I I, I think this was just a, a comfort thing that the girls removed their bras for, for additional comfort. Um, and uh, I'm not surprised that it is dry and intact because, you know, rucksacks are fairly or backpacks, should I say, are fairly, uh, you know, enclosed. Probably the zip was up and the water didn't penetrate the bag i i don't think that it's unusual uh you know that that everything was found dry and intact you know the cameras were there the camera was there should i say and the phones as well and obviously that's very important because you know it it gave the story uh of what happened to the girls you know all of that was contained in the uh, camera 
just to mention as well that $83 was also found in the backpack. So I think if there had been a gang or a killer, they would have taken the cash. And it's, you know, really great that the lady who handed in the bag was so honourable and that the cash was still intact. So that, you know, that just was lovely. Now, a lot of people have said if the girls had gotten into distress and they're at the base of a cliff, etc., you know, they knew time was running out. Why didn't they record messages on their phone for their families? Well, I think they wouldn't have wanted to drain the battery on their phones. When you're in that life and death situation, they may also not have wanted to distress their families. Perhaps, you know, they could have, you know, been injured or, you know, they were, you know, looking unwell, etc. And of course, both girls kept diaries. And we know that Lizanne had written beautiful things about her parents before she, you know, went on the track um, in her diary, for example. So I, I just think it was self-preservation. And probably to the end, they thought that in some way they were going to get rescued. You know, um, I, I think that they Obviously, the fact that they crossed over the Continental Divide, there was a little naivety there. Um, I think at this point, um, when investigators looked at the camera and saw all these photographs, there was about 90 photographs taken on the 8th of April. Bear in mind, they went missing or they sorry. They yeah, they went missing on the 1st. They took the trek on the 1st. There, on the 8th of April, there was about 90 images taken between 90 photographs taken between 1 a.m. and 4 a.m. And I think that at this point, Chris had most likely died. And I think that Leanne got into an awful panic and she did realize that she needed to communicate a message to the family. And this is the message. And it's as clear as day that, you know, they had fallen off a cliff. You can see this is taken from the base of a cliff. You can see the tree canopy above and the sky above. Um, and I, I just think that this was her way of trying to communicate what um, had happened and also at the same time cling on to whatever life was left in the uh, camera. Here we see a red carrier bag tied to some sticks. Um, this carrier bag had been uh, seen in the girls room at one point in, in one of the photographs that they had taken and it's obvious they were using it to wave for help because we do know on April 8th that helicopters etc were out looking for them but unfortunately they were in a part of the Panista which you know had dense forest cover and it wasn't easy to see them. Again, I get really mystified when I see so many sort of deep analysis of these photographs because I think to me it you know, looks obvious that this is somebody at the base of a cliff, quite a, a deep drop looking up at the forest cover above um, and the night sky. And I think this is the message she was trying to convey. We had a fall, we were trying to get help, etc. The nighttime photos also show how they'd use tissue and a mirror to attract attention. They probably had maybe used the words SOS, but again, sadly, uh, you know, they haven't been seen. So here's a photograph taken of the back of um, Lizanne's head. Um, and you can see that sort of on the right hand side, there is evidence of blood. I mean, this could be another reason why the girls didn't make recordings on their phones uh, in the event of passing away that their parents could see, because it's possible they were pretty bruised and bashed up if they had a significant fall. And, you know, this could have been an altruistic gesture on their part. They didn't want to worry their parents or, you know, leave, you know, really bad impression. Um, you know, that is something to be considered. And you can kind of see that there's, you know, sort of on the right hand side there, there seems to be evidence of blood. I suspect that Chris got some kind of a head injury. And I think what Leanne is trying to tell us in these photographs is that they fell at the base. They fell off a cliff. They were both of them immobile at the base of this cliff. Um, and, you know, that... In, Chris most likely had a head injury. And I think maybe she could be telling us that, in fact, you know, it's the head injury, that, you know, that maybe in the end is what killed uh, Chris uh, as much as sort of, you know, dehydration and everything else. Um, you know, uh, she she could be, you know, conveying this message. I, I think she was doing this in case the camera was was found.
About two months after the backpack was discovered, Lizanne's shoe was found with a flesh of foot inside. The bones of that foot were broken. So again, I think that would suggest that maybe Lizanne fell first uh, and um, Chris was injured getting to her or vice versa, or they both fell at the same time. Um, I think it could also, as I said, explain the 509 photo as well. They fell at that moment. Um, I think Chris was probably the more severely injured, possibly a head injury, but the DNA obviously matched. Um, so they were able to determine that this had been Lizanne. And um, yeah, so very, very poignant uh, discovery for uh, Lizanne's family. So not too far from um, uh, Lizanne's foot, Chris's pelvis was found. Um, and you can see it there on the left, um, and it was thought to be uh, bleached. Um, and uh, I, I think there is an explanation for this. There was also traces of phosphorus found on the pelvis. Now, this was deemed to be unusual because the soil in uh, that type of forest terrain tends to be low on phosphorus. So people thought that perhaps, uh, you know, her remains had been uh, bleached. Um, you know, or, you know, the decomposition of them, you know, artificially accelerated, if you like. I, I just think that more, more likely uh, Chris's remains were more open. I, I think that Lizanne didn't get too much further away. I think both women were injured and weren't very mobile. And I think that probably she ended up, Lizanne, sitting at the base of a tree um, because her foot was found in a tree. Now, that's not to say that, you know, an animal or something could have carried it there, but I, I think she most likely, you know, leaned against the base of a tree and passed away there, and her body was more enclosed, and therefore flesh, etc., was found uh, more intact than was the case with uh, Chris. Here we see a list of all the calls that the girls made uh, repeated calls from both phones to emergency services in Holland and in Panama. They just couldn't connect. At one point, they briefly connected to the Dutch medical, uh, or not medical, should I say, but emergency services. And sadly, the connection, it didn't last. You know, they just didn't have, they were in too remote a location um, to, to successfully connect call-wise, but they tried valiantly to the end. And actually, after April, Eighth, there were innumerable attempts um, uh, by, it would appear, Lizanne to enter a pin on Chris's phone unsuccessfully. Perhaps at that stage she was tired or fatigued, or, uh, and, and I think it's likely that Chris had passed away. Uh, there, were, there was no further action on any mobile phones uh, after April 11th. So, of course, after the girls, you know, were found to have passed away, people immediately thought had something suspicious happened. And, you know, suspicious things do happen. You know, there's the case of Catherine Jo Nett in 2017, who was murdered on a Panama island. Uh, you know, she had been strangled. Um, you know, so these awful things can happen. And people wondered, you know, had, you know, uh, Lizanne and Chris, you know, two beautiful girls being targeted maybe by a lone serial killer or by a gang who planned to traffic them or sexually assault them. Um, you know, some people wondered had their organs been harvested, all kinds of theories. But I personally feel that the evidence points far more to an accident having taken place. And I don't think any kind of gang or serial killer would be taking nighttime photos and all of these things uh, to cover their tracks. Um, so I, I think the accident is is the most likely uh, explanation. So this is a very interesting YouTube link. I've put the link there for you to have a look at. And it's a video called Answers for Chris. And it's about when Chris's parents tried to uh, retrace uh, Chris's steps on the Panista. And um, you can see Blue the dog tagged along. And actually Feliciano also came along. And again, many people found this strange because they thought, you know, is he immersing himself into the case? And he actually you know, was there when the foot was found, etc. Uh, he just seemed to be everywhere. But again, I, I just don't buy it. I, I, I think this is his livelihood. And I think certainly 
you know, at times, you know, his conduct is not appropriate, but that doesn't make you a killer. Um, something that is very interesting about the video is that um, Chris's parents are just mystified as to how the girls could have possibly gone off the trail because it's quite a prescribed trail and, you know, they walk it and they just can't see how they sort of veered off it. But, you know, these things happen and um, I, I, I certainly think that it's not impossible. So a lot of people are still not satisfied that, you know, Lizanne and Chris died accidentally. And there have been a number of, you know, investigations conducted by investigative journalists, essentially. And this one lost in Pamina, in Panama, should I say, apologies, is very uh, forensic and detailed. It talks to a lot of local people. Um, Mariana Atenzio and Jeremy Kreit, they actually retraced the steps uh, along the Panista of the women. They talked to a lot of locals who were very fearful. Now, I think locals are fearful of talking about it because obviously um, the local authorities, they want to get back to normal. They want tourism, et cetera, to thrive. And I think that's more where the fear is coming from. Um, there is also perhaps some fear associated also with uh, local gangs. Uh, but you can tell that people are very afraid to talk. So, uh, you know, it's amazing the information that uh, the, these journalists do actually get. So in the Lost in Panama podcast, they really sort of hone in on Feliciano because of his reputation with female tourists. Um, but again, I think the evidence points far more towards Chris and Lizanne having been in an accident. And I think that this is this man's livelihood. He's not stupid. Uh, aspersions have also been cast as suspicions in the direction of Feliciano's son, Tito, who's known to be hot headed and violent. He also associates with gang members. But again, I, I just think for every argument that you know, people put forward in relation to, you know, Feliciano or Tito, et cetera. I just think the evidence points towards an accident. Um, you know, you can see Feliciano in the answers for Chris's video when Chris's parents are retracing her steps on the Panista and he's there, you know, and he was also there when, you know, body parts were found, etc. And a lot of people have said, you know, Feliciano, you know, he's everywhere. He's inserted himself into this case. But I think, you know, he's a trail guide and, you know, he knows the area. It makes sense that he would have been involved in looking for the girls, for trying to find out what happened to them. And, um, you know, I personally feel that he has had nothing to, to do with the deaths of Chris and his arm. So this is a very well-known photograph in all the analysis of what happened to Lizanne and Chris. Um, it's basically a picture of Osmond Venezuela having a swim and it's thought you know, with some friends that Lizanne and Chris are in the photographs. But in actual fact, from the sources I've been reading and I've read uh, innumerable sources, they all say that actually this photograph was taken on the day that the girls were trekking and, for, and at a location it was quite a distance from where they were you can see from the photograph that it's just sort of a play on the light uh, there's kind of a red hue to the light maybe i don't know what time of the day they were swimming but it gave this red hue and i've seen other versions of the photograph where it's just four guys swimming so um another thing that emerges in the lost in panama uh, podcast is that they have discovered that there have been five deaths in Boqueta since Lizanne and Chris passed away. And three of them are in some way even tenuously linked to Lizanne and Chris. So there's sort of an implication that maybe the girls were killed by a gang member or, or you know, members of a gang. And there's some kind of cover up and anybody who knows anything has been uh, killed. And um, Osman's mother, uh, Osman would actually eventually go on to be murdered himself. His death would be ruled a murder after the girls were found dead. Uh, he would uh, subsequently go on to be found dead as well. And he would have an injury to the side of his head and found, be found face down in the water. And his death was ruled a homicide. And his mother is interviewed by the lost in Panama. 
podcast uh, journalist and she would say that she had heard that a gang had targeted Chris and uh, uh, Lizanne and that you know the girls had gone in touch with them to buy drugs and been out clubbing with them etc now this is where I start to know that many of these stories that are being unearthed and the interviews that are being unearthed uh, with local inhabitants are actually you know people living locally are actually false because it's a big leap to go from being somebody like Lizanne who's writing in her diary that she feels completely out of a depth and she feels like a two-year-old toddler that misses her mum to suddenly being somebody who's clubbing with local gang members and buying drugs I just don't buy it and uh, I, I think that I'm not sure whether the Lost in Panama podcast journalists paid for interviews or whether people are paid for interviews but I think there are people potentially cashing in uh, since uh, Lizanne and uh, Chris's death, um, you know, and I think that Osman's death is far more likely just linked to gang activity. And I don't think there's any kind of uh, cover up uh, uh, at all. So anybody who knows my channel will know that I always like to look at sort of research that's out there, you know, reports or in academic studies and and I was looking at mortality amongst gang members. And you can see there's a study there by the Population Association of America. I just did a Google search. And there's also a report from the American Journal of Psychiatry on delinquency and mortality, a 50 year follow up. And, you know, these kind of reports and studies show that, you know, gang members, you know, they die young um, and in violent circumstances, mysterious circumstances. And I think that Osman's death is far more likely linked to knowing a gang and being, you know, familiar with a gang um, than it being linked to, you know, him having information on some kind of murder of uh, Lizanne and Chris. I, I, I don't I, I just think it was more related to general gang activity. So the taxi driver who would drop the girls on the 1st of April to the base of Panista, again, this is explored in Lost in the, in the Lost in Panama podcast. He too would turn up dead a year later um, and um, face down in water, you know, he drowned. Um, and again, it's said in the podcast, you know, that this is mysterious. Many people view this as mysterious, you know, was there some kind of a cover up? But I think there's an explanation for this and it's not to do with a cover up. So this is a really interesting academic study and it looks at the health outcomes and psychological outcomes for people who are wrongly accused of a crime. Can you imagine being the last person to drop the girls, which the taxi driver was, the last person to see them, to drop them to the base of the Panista. I'm sure he was inundated locally and internationally with people accusing him of all sorts of things. I strongly suspect that he committed suicide. It was just all too much for him. And this study is really, really interesting. And it does mention that people that are wrongfully accused of, uh, you know, murder, uh, they suddenly will have like suicide ideation and Manny will go on and commit suicide. So this is the case of Sunil Tripathi, who was wrongly accused by people on social media of being the Boston Marathon bomber. He would go on to commit suicide by drowning. Um, I think it's very possible that the taxi driver that dropped uh, Lizanne and uh, Chris to the base of the Panista on the 1st of April. He was the last person to see them alive. I, I think it's very conceivable that all kinds of things were said about him. We don't know what messages he could have received from people. And I think maybe it just, it all got too, too much for him. And, um, you know, trial by social media, essentially. And, you know, that he also uh, took his life, uh, suicide uh, by drowning. So in this piece, uh, it says that investigators have established that Chris and Lizanne fell off a cliff. And we know that the Panamanian authorities also said that they thought it was an accident. After this uh, investigation that is described in this piece, the family said that they felt that the explanation was you know, plausible, that they were fully satisfied that this is what happened. So, you know, if the families feel who initially were very doubtful about, you know, the accident theory, 
if they have now made peace subsequent to the investigation, which was, you know, very thorough, that this was an accident, you know, I, I think that, you know, the evidence points to it. And, you know, hats off to Lizanne, who was probably the last one alive to take all those photographs. And it's there in black and white, you know, we're at the base of a cliff. We we made something to wave at helicopters. We, we got a mirror. We tried reflecting light. We, you know, uh, Chris is now, you know, seriously injured and passed away. She left it there in black and white. Um, and, uh, you know, the investigators have also uh, felt that this is the likely theory, uh, you know, and I feel that this is the likely theory. I, I agree with uh, the families and I, I think this is what happened. This is a very interesting YouTube video, and I've actually put a link in the bottom, and it's Peter R. de Vries, who is a Dutch investigative recorder, extremely famous. Uh, he was killed in 2021 as he left um, a studio and uh, a TV studio. He was 64. He was known for his investigation of murderers and the mob, etc. Um, but he does, he does say in this video, he's commenting about Chris and his aunt's, uh, you know, demise and, you know, their deaths. And he was saying, you know, that the parents always sort of assumed that the two girls couldn't have wandered off the trail, that they would never be so stupid as to do that. But you could just never make those assumptions. He makes that point. And, um, you know, I think it's a very valid point. And I, I think, you know, it, it it all turned out to be correct. You know, Chris and Lizanne, you know, they just pushed too far. They went beyond the continental divide, uh, you know, and they would eventually fall fall off a cliff you know the the this terrain is treacherous but something that's you know very odd about um peter you know as i mentioned he's a very famous or he was a very famous uh, investigative journalist in um you know holland you know you you could say you know here's another death that in some way even tenuously is linked to Lizanne and Chris, but, you know, I, I was reading that, you know, there are, you know, suspects, there's expected to be a trial in 2024. So, it, you know, it isn't linked. And this is the point that I'm trying to make is that, you know, there are deaths that have occurred subsequent to, you know, Lizanne and um, Chris's fall and their deaths in the jungle. But I just personally feel they're either linked to gangland activity. This is another example here. This man was often investigating gangs and mobs and, you know, um, high level murders and, and it just made him a vulnerable target. None of these things, I believe, are actually, you know, a kind of cover up because of I don't believe the taxi driver's death is some kind of cover up. I think that was most likely a suicide. So I think that, you know, I think that just there's been a lot of sensationalism since Lizanne and Chris passed away. I think they basically died from a fall and that the deaths that have taken place afterwards are just, you know, coincidental or or in the case of the tax driver, I think that was probably the, the strongest, uh, you know, the death that's most strongly linked because I think that was most likely a suicide. So I think the the video that I the link that I shared in the previous slide is definitely worth looking at. Peter had some very interesting insights on the case, and just very sad that he should die at the age of sixty four. And you can see from all the flowers that were left just how esteemed, you know, he was in in Dutch society. So I want to get to my basic argument, and my basic argument is is that there is a sort of a new form of um you know death in a touristic if you like context and we can see here a piece in the irish times we have it here in ireland man dies after falling from cliffs of mohar you know they're beautiful cliffs here in ireland while taking a selfie here's another one tourist 38 dies while attempting to take photo at edge of over 200 foot cliff in australia we have to think of as well the kind of injury you can get when you fall off a cliff. So we see here in the Belfast Telegraph, woman sustains head injury after falling off the cliff. So we know that Lizanne took a photo of the back of Chris's head, you know, so she seems to be hinting at some kind of head injury. Um, we know that Lizanne, the uh, bones in her foot were broken, um, you know, and certainly in researching this, 
uh, episode uh, of Dark Vanishings, I came across lots of articles about people breaking legs or, you know, their feet uh, or one or both if they, you know, fall from a cliff. Um, so, you know, this is something else to consider. So now I'm getting to the nub of my key argument. And this is an interesting piece in Rolling Stone uh, called Death by Selfie, Disturbing Stories of Social Media Picks Gone Wrong. And it talks about essentially, uh, you know, situations, you know, predominantly in a touristic context where, you know, uh, people have taken a selfie in some sort of, you know, uh, exotic location or maybe near a cliff, etc. And they fall off and they die. So what floored me about this article is that it says that in 2015, um, more people died from selfies gone wrong, uh, you know, on cliffs or in, you know, exotic touristic locations than were people, than, than were tourists eaten by sharks, essentially. And that floored me. I was like, wow, that is just an, a mind blowing statistic. So this is a phenomenon. And I personally believe that this is actually what happened to Lizanne and to Chris that day. I think they were restless. They were disappointed about their placement. They pushed beyond the continental uh, divide. They were trying to get, you know, they were taking photographs constantly. And I think they were trying to get more fun, more out there photographs. It was a way of passing the time. And then when they would go home and post them later that evening, a way of connecting with people back home, they were at a bit at a loose end. And I think that it was in the quest for all these great photos that, um, they ended up, uh, you know, uh, falling and dying. And, uh, you know, um, I think that's what happened when they were about to take photo 509. I think one or both of them lost their footing. Um, and, you know, it could have even been the camera falling and some kind of mechanical glitch that made that just sort of somehow self delete. And I, I, I think that, um, you know, or they deleted it because it was a strange photograph of two people falling down a cliff and uh, you know they didn't want to worry anybody i i just think that this is actually what happened in the quest for these exciting photographs they just got carried away and they didn't know the terrain they were in treacherous terrain and they lost their footing um and you know not quite uh you know taking a selfie though they did take selfies so it's not impossible they could have been taking a selfie in a, a beautiful spot not realizing that there was a cliff nearby cliff edge um but this is what i feel uh, essentially happened the two girls i think that there's something truly lovely about these two women i think that uh, Lizanne was probably fairly immobile as well with a foot injury and possibly Chris had a head injury. But I think that probably uh, uh, Lizanne could have maybe, you know, sort of limped her way out of the jungle. You know, we do hear of these stories to try and get help. I think that they chose to stick together in all likelihood. They were there for each other. And even after, you know, Chris passing, which I suspect she did first, Lizanne, you know, used the camera to leave a record of what had happened to them, that they had fallen off this cliff. They had tried to wave for help. Um, you know, uh, Chris had a head injury. You know, they were thinking of others right up to the very end. And it's just such a, a, a pity that these two girls didn't get to live out their life, their their dreams, um, you know. But one thing that is truly beautiful is that they were truly friends uh, until the very end and they packed a lot into their short lives. Thank you so much for watching. I really appreciate it. Please do like, comment or subscribe. Every like, every comment, every new subscriber means the absolute world to me. I look forward to seeing you in the next episode of Dark Vanishings. Do take care and all the very best.